welcome again to the Inclusivity Lounge. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here with our third panel on female entrepreneurship and the financing app. I am really honored to have here with me uh, Mrs. Mirto Papathano, partner at Metavalon VC and Kaufman Fellow. Uh, also, Zina Mavroidi, Managing Director at eFresh. And uh, via a video call, Cheryl Miller Van Dyke, uh, head of the EU delegation and expert on digital equity and women's entrepreneurship for the W20 engagement group. Welcome everyone, I'm so happy to have you here with us. Um, I must say as an introduction that Women on Top has just completed um, a, a piece of research on the financing gap and female entrepreneurship in Greece. We are not yet ready to release our data, but I am really glad that you're here to share some of your insights and your experiences uh, about this very important issue. Uh, so, Cheryl, can we start with you? Uh, of course. Can we we, are, we have been talking about uh, the female entrepreneurship gap and the financing gap. Can you share some of the data and the insights you have on what's happening in uh, the EU and maybe in other parts of the, world, of the world as well? Sure. Well, first, I want to thank you so much for inviting me to this amazing event and to, congr to congratulate Greece on 200 years, of course. Um, Thank you. And also just preface that um, my work in this area is really focused on skills, uh, digital skills in particular, and um, increasing the number of women entrepreneurs, uh, female entrepreneurs. So I think some of our panelists have a deeper experience on the financing gap and have even um, overseen some reports on that. So I would defer to them. But what I would like to set up in this um, discussion is to link to the larger discussion of um, digitally enabled startup by women and digitally driven startup by women, um, which is where Europe is really, um, I would say it's a no man's land, but actually it's a no woman's land. And this is a, a pattern that has existed for 15 years, so despite the enormous increase in innovation driven by digital um, developments and the digital disruption, the participation of women is actually decreasing um, and in the best case, flatlining. So the number of women IT experts in Europe, for example, has not increased during this entire huge disruption that is taking place. And when you look at the intersection of entrepreneurship and the disruption, we see kind of a double whammy scenario where there are not enough women doing entrepreneurship overall, although I think COVID and a lot of, uh, and financial crises may force us more into that scenario. So not enough women doing um, startup in general, but definitely where the, the digital skills gap exists that this is also um, inhibiting us um, to fully take part as entrepreneurs and innovators in the digital society. And I think you see this then in the numbers that some of the, my colleagues here on the panel, I hope will show uh, for you, that women are also overlooked almost completely um, as far as venture capital funding. Um, and we have this kind of supply and demand problems. So there are not enough women doing the innovation and the ones that are, are not getting the kind of funding that they need. And this is a problem in Europe, but it is a problem, I hate to say, around the world. Thank you so much for the sad but uh, real news. Uh, Mirto, uh, you can speak both as an investor and as an entrepreneur, I believe. So can you share your insights about what the situation in Greece is uh, around female entrepreneurship and financing of uh, female enterprise? Sure. So thank you, first of all, for uh, including me in this conversation. I think it's a fascinating topic, and I think we all have a lot to learn from each other. Uh, and bring forward some data we have and also some empirical experience we're seeing in the market. Uh, so in my comments today, I'm going to speak as an institutional investor. As you said in your foreword, I, uh, I'm a partner at Metavalon Venture Capital. We do investments in early stage technology firms. 
Um, so the, I think the first step in discussing the financing gap is quantifying this gap. Um, so if, if you want to look at the, the CE region, so Central Eastern European uh, Union region, um, you, and, and you want to separate how much of the funding goes into which teams, and I'm talking about VC funding and private equity funding, you will see that in the last year only 1% went to all female-led teams and 5% went to mixed teams. That means including a woman founder in the team. The rest of it, so 94% of the total funding went to all male teams. Um, if you want to compare that to the, the statistics in Greece, and it's a little bit more difficult because we don't have the data, as you know from, from your research, uh, the numbers are uh, very similar. So you're talking about 9 or 10% of the funding in the last three or four years that has gone into mixed teams. There is yet to be an investment <laughs> in an all-female team. And the rest of it, so high 90s as a percentage, go into, uh, go into male founders. Um, what is also interesting to note, and, and I think it will come up in the discussion uh, later why this is important, is how many of those investment decisions are taken by women. So how many women are leading VC firms, how many women are part of the investment committees, and how many women uh, are participating in those decisions made. At C, uh, Central Eastern European level, it's only 8%, so only 8% of VCs have a woman as a partner, and in Greece the numbers are similar. So you only have three partners at investor level, at VC level, out of the 38 partners uh, of the women, of, the, of uh, all of the VCs. So the gap is huge. Uh, when we're talking about minding the, minding the gap, we're talking about this kind of divergence, and I think it's important to think about it comparatively to any other industry. And I would challenge anyone to think of another industry that has this funding gap. So. Uh, the, the, the numbers are staggering, and I would like to start with that. Yes, and I can say consistency here. It's not only Greece. It's everywhere in the world. So, uh, Zina, from um, an entrepreneur, a founder perspective, what has been your experience about this divergence? Um, um, okay, thanks um, uh, for, for having me, first of all. Um, I would say that um, I feel like um, women are, uh, first of all, less exposed to external financing, and sometimes this is by choice. Um, so uh, sometimes we tend to use our own money for financing, uh, then go to friends and family, uh, and then possibly move on to external sources of uh, financing. It seems like uh, this uh, is, uh, is a trend that uh, research has backed up as well. Um, and uh, the idea is, uh, I think partly this is because we feel the responsibility of being funded. So we, we, the responsibility that, uh, that it is. Uh, so we uh, see that funding creates uh, a responsibility for bringing back value out of the investment. And, uh, and uh, someone has invested, invested in us, so we want to uh, essentially, in the end, uh, give that money back somehow. And we feel that responsibility, so we don't see that as an accomplishment per se, not, not, as, not, uh, not yet. Also, I think that this is uh, partly because of um, having a weaker individual network uh, that we can rely on, and this is critical, this is very important. Uh, we don't get access to the right people, and when we do, we don't uh, maintain, uh, I guess, those relationships as actively. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is part of the job, really. So uh, we, we need to create those relationships, and we need to actively pursue uh, the development of those relationships. And, and sometimes this is not um, as actively pursued by female uh, founders. Um, I would say then that uh, those discussions that uh, we don't have um, uh, as, as actively, those um, discussions are, uh, are so important uh, that help us reshape our strategy and also inform our future decisions. And we need to have plenty of those discussions. We need to have um, the right discussions with the right people to get something out of some of these discussions um, in the end. So um, missing out on those discussions is, o is only increasing uh, that gap. And lastly, um, I think we need to talk about the, the unconscious bias. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the fact that uh, all of us are biased, even if we don't, even if we realize it or, or we don't, uh, we are all, uh, we all uh, have bias uh, in our decision making. Um, and the first step is to acknowledge that. 
so the fact that we uh, say hire people that are similar to us or we invest in people that are possibly similar to us and yet when a woman enters a room asking for money she would rarely um, see people that are similar to her um, and Marta is obviously an exception here but this is typically the case um, so this makes things uh, hard in, in a way um, and also uh, on, on top of that when um, the uh, decision making when the factors uh, saying whether an investment is successful or not are not clearly set, uh, this uh, mm -hmm. itself leaves room for individual bias. Mm -hmm. So this makes things a little bit more complicated to understand w what is it that we need to do to meet those, um, uh, th those, those criteria or not, um, to be successful or not, so what good looks like really. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess uh, we, we acknowledge that there is some gradual progress in all of these, um, all of these things. Uh, however, there's, uh, there's definitely room for improvement. And I think that uh, if we take a step back and we acknowledge that all of these factors exist and they, they make a difference in a founder's life, uh, and we, we try to start fixing some of them, that mm -hmm. would be beneficial for, for everybody, both <laughs> men and women. That's so true, and all the issues you touched upon, the bias, the um, lack of in female investors, and the confidence, the responsibility, mm -hmm. um, are also prevalent in our research. I want to leave bias and investors out of the discussion for, for a moment, and I want to turn to Cheryl to talk about skills. You talked about digital skills, but Zina also mentioned the issue of um, a high level of responsibility that maybe women feel stronger than, uh, than men. Uh, and, and, and the confidence uh, element in this belief that they can make something of that money, something of value. So any other skills that you feel that women need to build in order to be more successful as entrepreneurs and as um, um, funded entrepreneurs? No, I don't think there are other skills. Um, because I, you know, after my decades work in this area, I'm always looking away from the let's fix the woman answer to the let's fix the system answer. So a resounding no, there's nothing more that women need to know how to do or do better or learn. I mean, there are technical things, of course, that we're all capable of with study. Um, and you did mention the, I mean, the sense of accountability. This is only an added value, right? That we do pay our bills, we pay our loans. Um, but clearly what we're working against is the, you wanted to take it off the table, but it is about bias. So um, why, I mean, it's also, it's also a, a population issue. So the population of decision makers is very much weighted in one direction that makes it difficult um, to have a favor a consensus on mission on what your company is trying to accomplish and again to then align funding with what it is you're trying to do with your enterprise fortunately there's movement on that side of the topic as well i'm sure as zina can tell you as zina can tell you um, that you know, we are seeing more uh, more women in VC, thank goodness. We're seeing more funds being built that are female-friendly investors. We are seeing work on, so I said I've, I've uh, focused largely on this half of the equation of populating, uh, getting women entrepreneurs out there. But I see more and more we need to work on the other side of the equation. And fortunately, we are also trying to school women into becoming angel investors um, and to having these technical skills to do uh, venture capital as well. Um, but these doors are closed. It's a fact. I mean, the, the situation in Greece only um, is a microcosm of what it is in Europe and everywhere else where, I mean, and with uh, optimistic figures is that 50%, 15% of VC partners are women. So, um, I mean, that's one set of biases, one set of challenges. Um, if you want to look at, at, again, I wouldn't look at skills. We talk a lot about building confidence in girls and women. And that is just really the, the, um, the, the opposite swing of the pendulum because 
We are also busy telling girls and women their entire lives that they're valued less in society. So I think um, this is in media, this is all kinds of other biases and portrayals that girls at the age of six understand that they are not as important as boys are, which is, I mean, then just imagine working through your life to, to unpack that. So um, yeah, the challenge is really um, towards, oh, sorry about this, um, is um, the challenge is to have uh, that epiphany among women that they're capable of these things um, and to kind of unpack the, even the unconscious biases that women have. And, you know, my, my perspective on that is simply by giving them the exposure and the mission to deliver on the needs that we need um, to have addressed in society and to have the funders and the, uh, you know, and the, and the structures in place that will support them to do that. I love the concept of exposure. Thank you so much about that. Uh, Mirto, is there any role that um, regulators or the state or the European Union or any institutions have to play in fixing this problem? Or is it just a society issue that will resolve by itself at some point? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, before I address this question, mm -hmm. if, if you allow me to, to um, comment on something Cheryl said, sure. which I think is very interesting. So we have to look at the investments that are getting done again by private equity and venture capitals uh, that are getting done today and will be getting done the next 20 years versus what was uh, invested in the last 20 years. So the last 20 years, there was a big focus on software. There was a big focus on everything developed around uh, this industry and digital skills, et cetera. I think it's becoming clear and it's becoming urgent that the, 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 the investment need to follow the world's biggest problems, mm -hmm. such as climate change, such as diversity, such as uh, very urgent needs that, that, um, that um, pl the planet and we all have and uh, companies need to be addressing. And health. This, and health, of health. course. And this is a monumental opportunity for women entrepreneurs. I will give you an example from Ireland. Ireland is leading uh, the, the pack, let's say, in the European Union. It has 19% of, of uh, all investment going into women. It's not a huge percentage, but it's much better than the lower digits. And it also has one in five uh, VCs include a woman partner at decision level. So uh, last year was the first year that 100 million got invested in Irish startups. Of this 100 million, 60% went to uh, female-led uh, entrepreneurs who had to do with health, and 30% went to female-led entrepreneurs that had to do with what we call deep tech. So actually putting science and technology into the use of humanity. Uh, so this is a shift that is happening now. I think women have a big role to play there, and I think this actually helps in better representation, better diversity. We see it in our portfolio as well, where a lot of the women founders, a lot of the women CEOs have to do with health investments That's and environmental investments. So going back to your question, uh, the, the issue of regulation is always a touchy one because mm -hmm. no one wants to, to discuss about quotas, about motivations, etc. So what I will, I will try to, to do is, is to give you an opinion about what I think needs to be done at each stage um, of investment. So the, the first thing that needs to be addressed is what we call the pipeline. So, mm -hmm. so how many women entrepreneurs you're actually seeing. Now, given uh, that, that, you're, that most VCs are comprised of men today, uh, and given also that most VCs use their own network as the first source um, of scouting entrepreneurs and looking at women, the first thing we need to do is start measuring those things. So start to measure how many uh, companies you're actually seeing, how many companies come to the last investment stage that are mixed companies, and, and have those reported and measured. This is something that can easily be done. Uh, Europe is very specific in terms of its capital structure. Uh, the, the EIF, the European Investment Fund, is the largest investor by far in all uh, European funds. I think it owns 52% of, of, of participation. So th this is one of the things that can easily be done in terms of actually measuring. Just to give you an idea, uh, we discussed this in, in, in the research you did with women on top, the range of women in the pipeline, so mixed teams in the pipeline, ranges from 5 to 29%. Uh, needless to say, the 29% is from the only funds that include uh, women um, at, the, at the partner level. So, so one thing is increasing the pipeline, and I think what Zina also mentioned before about women getting 
more exposed to people who are more similar uh, to them and, and also can understand their concept is, is, is very important. Um, the, the second thing that needs to, to happen, and this is uh, the role of maybe institutional investors such as the AAF, other private LPs, family offices, et cetera, is to understand who's making the investment decision. So uh, if you're discussing about uh, investment committees, so, so teams of VCs where there are no women um, making any decisions, then the, the percentages are bound to be like the ones we're seeing today. Just as a point of, of, of uh, data as well, uh, we're having a discussion now amongst different women at European level who are partners at VCs. Uh, there are all the, uh, I think all but two European countries are represented. And there, um, the actual percentage of female founders that has been funded by a VC that has at least one woman at partner level is 36%. If you compare that to the 4% that we were discussing previously, it is a massive change. And here is where LPs and, and the funders of the VCs essentially can also look deeper into the diversity of the teams, how this can be encouraged, how people who start as associates, as principals at the venture capital firms can eventually take up those roles, and how to also encourage um, investment in first-time managers. Uh, you're bound to be a first-time manager if you haven't done your own fund. And the, the third thing is how do you support women entrepreneurs after the funding is done? And I think this is also critical. So where you can have interventions is at co-investment level. So you mm. can encourage co-investment at female-led startups, which uh, traditionally have about 40% less funding for the exact same startup, just because, uh, you know, they happen to be women. So you can encourage co-investment. You can encourage co-investment between women investors. You can create special vehicles and special structures for that. And again, try to measure everything just so that you are making sure that you're addressing the right problems. Data, data is so critical. And thanks for mentioning that. Um, Zina, um, what are your thoughts about what needs to be done? Sure. I mean, um, going back before I answer that to the, to the skills question, because I think that's quite important. I, I, I think we can all agree we see leaders around the world uh, running countries or managing businesses. They all have very different set of skills uh, and they run um, their businesses successfully. So I think the real question is uh, what kind of skills uh, could uh, positively impact an investment discussion and what is it that we need to be aware of that could potentially challenge an, an investment discussion? From, from a pitching point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess from a film perspective, uh, it's often seen that um, we tend to talk a lot about the risks, just to give an example. We tend to talk a lot to warn our investors, to make them aware of all the dangers and all the risks. And um, following up on that, if at the same time we don't uh, present the value coming from those risks, then we paint an unbalanced picture without realizing it. Uh, and if you consider that uh, what the audience is used to uh, is, is uh, maybe a more optimistic, a more ambitious approach, um, then uh, that picture that we paint that could be uh, unbalanced in a way is not something that is very common. And it could come as a surprise and it could, it could bring a, a very um, different vibe to the conversation, just something to be aware of. But these kind of things, painting a balanced picture or uh, confidence, that is very, very often the topic, um, is, is not, uh, I would say, something that uh, uh, we are all born with uh, this specific capacity. It's something that people can, can grow and develop uh, if, we, you know, if we work on that. So I wouldn't say it's something in terms of, of a skill set that should stop anyone from starting a business or um, uh, from uh, having the, the will to, to lead a team and, and so on. Um, now, going back to what can be done, I think uh, we should all think of uh, the impact of not doing anything. Uh, uh, and going back to my previous point, if, if you hire from a certain pool of people, if you invest in a certain pool of people and not everybody has access to that pool, then you don't hire the best and you, you're missing out on opportunities. And our job is not to miss out. Our job is to focus on the best and utilize the best because this is when value is created. 
So we need to be aware of that and we need to, um, to create an inclusive environment because this is when everybody um, is, uh, and is, this is for everyone's benefit. There are obviously metrics that say that uh, female um, uh, entrepreneurship often leads to more profitable businesses, so let's say, or if we ever manage to close that financing gap, then uh, global GDP will go up by 26%, which is great to have all those measurable, um, going back to your data point, um, uh, information. Uh, but I think for me it's an ethical point as well. We all need to be able to start from the same point. Uh, we need to have fairness and democracy when it comes to funding. So we all need to have access to the right, um, uh, to the right people. We all need to be part of that pool. Um, and I think, uh, what, what is it that we can do? It depends on everyone's position, but things like uh, equal access to information, so we don't have to have access to that specific network to be able to move forward, or access to training and, and mentorship and, um, uh, and personal development are important things. Uh, and then, uh, going back to my previous point, making things like the criteria of uh, an investment visible and, and public that helps people understand what is it that they need to do to achieve that. So uh, it, it differs from principles to technical points of view, but I think uh, there are very tangible actions that we can take to move things forward. That's so great. Thank you uh, all about this, these great insights. Uh, we will, I know we will love working with you to um, achieve these tangible uh, results. Thank you, Cheryl, for, for being with us from afar. Thank you both for being here. Uh, we have two great panels to follow, one uh, on the digital skills gap and one on inclusive leadership in um, the world of technology. Uh, so thanks for being uh, here with us today, tonight. And uh, great. Thank you. looking Thank forward you so to following your work in the future. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.